This is IBM, the Islamic Broadcasting Network. The following program is sponsored by the Islamic Media Foundation, sharing the guidance of Allah through broadcast media and the Internet. Welcome to Biography with your host, Suhaib al Sayyid, featuring the lives of great Muslim men and women who made a difference. Assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you, and welcome to Biography. I'm your host, Suhaib al Sayyid. All praise is due to Allah, the creator, cherisher, and sustainer of the universe. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, glory be to him. And I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his last and final messenger. May the peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah be upon him, his companions, and those who follow his path until the day of judgment. He was a man of great stature amongst the people of Medina, a man to whom all turned for guidance and direction. He was a man who had attained a high level of knowledge and understanding, not only in the general sciences of Islam, but specifically in the science of jurisprudence. He mastered and excelled the science of jurisprudence, a field that requires much attention and devotion. In fact, it's one of the most difficult sciences for a scholar to master, as it entails precision as well as piety. It's a field that's very detailed in nature, addressing a variety of issues. It deals with the rights of people, men and women alike. This great individual had not only mastered the science of jurisprudence, but he also came to be known for his expertise, in addition to being well respected for it. In fact, one of his contemporaries commented and said that when it came to matters of inheritance and distribution of estates, as well as financial issues and contracts, people always turned to this man and sought his ruling and decision. This man had also earned a reputation for being very honest and trustworthy, thus gaining the trust of people in general. For this reason, whenever people needed to write a contract or record a private matter, it was with this man that they trusted their secrets. People had come to respect the fact that by no means would he divulge a secret. This was a man who had inherited love for knowledge and hard, dedicated work from his father. And he put what he had learned from his father into action. Just like his father before him, this man found no task insurmountable, and he strived his best to achieve his goals in life. Given these great traits and characteristics this man had, shall we not discover his identity? And could it be that he would one day be remembered as one of the great seven jurists of Medina? That's what we'll find out when we return. Don't go away. We'll be right back. These are the mothers of the world. They raise every new generation. They... Uh, excuse me, pardon me. Yes? What about the nagging? Nagging? Take off the garbage, do your homework. She's helping you build good character, teaching you things like responsibility, trustworthiness, honor, compassion, integrity. Okay, okay. And because she loves you. I know you're gonna say that. Kindness to mothers is a gateway to paradise. Have you shown her love today? This message has been brought to you by your American Muslim neighbors. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Islamic Media Foundation. Do you enjoy IBN's programs? Do you think it's important for us to be on the air? Support IBN by making a pledge today, a dollar a day, to the Islamic Media Foundation. Help IBN programs to continue by making your monthly contribution today. Pledge a dollar a day online at www.ibn.net or call us to pledge over the phone at 703-241-9659. Help us continue to be your voice, the voice of American Muslims.
Welcome back to Biography on IBN, the Islamic Broadcasting Network. I'm your host, Suhaib al-Sayyid. Kharijah ibn Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari was born to a noble and respected family in Medina in the year 29 after the Hijrah, or migration of the Prophet peace be upon him, from Mecca to Medina, corresponding to the year 651. His father was the well-known companion, Zayd ibn Thabit, may Allah be pleased with him. His mother was also a noble and respected woman, Umm Sa'd bin Sa'd ibn Rabia, may Allah be pleased with her. Kharija was born into the clan of Bani Najjar, one of the highly respected clans in the Arabian Peninsula at the time. In fact, the clan was so respected that the Prophet, peace be upon him, is reported to have commented on the clan, saying, You are my brethren, and I am from amongst you, referring to the honor and respect that the clan enjoyed. Perhaps it would be sufficient to mention that Kharija's father, Zaid, had the great honor and privilege of being one of those commissioned to compile the Holy Qur'an and put it together. At the time, the first caliph, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, had decided that it was important to compile the Qur'an together to protect it from being lost. He went to Zayd and said to him, O Zayd, you are a man of wisdom, and we hold nothing against you. During the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him, you used to write down the revelation as it came down to him. So seek out the verses of the Qur'an and compile them together. Up to that point, the Qur'an, although it had been completely revealed, had not been placed together in one place. All the verses had not been compiled together. And many of those who had memorized the verses of the Qur'an were either killed or had begun to pass away. And Caliph Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was afraid that if many of these people died and the Qur'an had not been compiled, it would be lost over time. Thus it was that he called Zayd and others and commissioned them to compile the Qur'an. But when Zayd heard this, he looked at Abu Bakr and said, How can you do something that the Messenger of Allah did not do? He was referring to the fact that during his lifetime, the Prophet, peace be upon him, had not directed the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to compile the verses of the Qur'an into one written collection. But Abu Bakr comforted him and said, By Allah, it is better that we do so. And so it was that Zayd ibn Thabit, along with three other companions, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, Ubay ibn Ka'b, and Abu Zayd, may Allah be pleased with them all, worked to complete the task of compiling the Qur'an. What a great honor and responsibility at the same time Zayd had. Even before being commissioned by Caliph Abu Bakr to compile the Qur'an, Zayd had been commissioned by the Prophet peace be upon him to write down the verses of the Qur'an as they were being revealed to him. Such was the connection that Zayd had with the Prophet peace be upon him and with the Qur'an early on. We also see in this interaction between Zayd and Abu Bakr the degree to which the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were keen to make sure that any action they embarked on was in accordance with the reported actions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Given this care and love that Zayd had for the Prophet, peace be upon him, it's no surprise that his son Kharija would grow up with the same degree of love and respect for the Prophet, peace be upon him. Zayd was also a very knowledgeable companion. In fact, he was so knowledgeable that the Prophet, peace be upon him, described him by saying, the most knowledgeable about inheritance is Zayd ibn Thabit. That was the field in which Zayd excelled, and it was a field in which his son, Kharija, would also eventually excel. Kharija was well respected by his contemporaries. Many of his traits and characteristics were narrated and transmitted through his friends and contemporaries. One contemporary called Zayd ibn Sa'ib described Kharija by saying, I saw between Kharija's eyes the effect of prostration, meaning that in the area between his eyes on his forehead, 
there was a clear mark that indicated that he spent extensive time prostrating himself in humility to his Lord and Creator. What an amazing way to describe someone. This person didn't describe the physical appearance of Kharija or his clothing or perhaps even one of his traits. Rather, he summarized everything about Kharija by simply saying that he could see the effect of prolonged prostration on his forehead between his eyes. Such characterization was certainly sufficient to convey the overall picture of who Kharija was and how he lived his life. And it should be of no surprise to us that Kharija would be a man of prolonged prostration to Allah. He was a man conscious of Allah's presence, fearful of his punishment, hopeful in his reward. But he was also the son of a great companion. A companion amongst many other companions whom Allah described in the Quran by saying, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and those who are with him are strong against unbelievers, but compassionate amongst each other. You will see them bow and prostrate themselves in prayer, seeking grace from Allah and His good pleasure. On their faces are their marks, being the traces of their prostration. This is their similitude in the Torah, and their similitude in the Gospel is like a seed that sends forth its blade and then makes it strong. It then becomes thick, and it stands on its own stem, filling the sores with wonder and delight. As a result, it fills the unbelievers with rage at them. Allah has promised those among them who believe and do righteous deeds, forgiveness, and a great reward. Indeed, Kharija was amongst those who realized the importance of his relationship with his Creator. Allah, glory be to him. And he was an individual who would spend much of his time in worship, obedience, and prostration to his Lord. Kharija was a man who dressed modestly, yet he also dressed well. He recognized that when Allah bestowed his blessing upon his servant, he expected his servant to reflect that blessing to dress in a way not too extravagant, yet that reflected the blessing that Allah had bestowed upon him. Kharija had four brothers, Ismail, Sulaiman, Yahya, and Sa'd. He learned and narrated the sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, on the authority of his father, Zayd, his mother, Umm Sa'd, his uncle, Yazid, the companion, Usam ibn Zayd, and Umm al Again, just as in the case of many of the other seven jurists of Medina, we see that Kharija sought knowledge from all the companions he had access to, men or women. What was important was gaining the knowledge, and much of it was with the women. There were many students who learned from Kharija and narrated on his authority. Among these students were Ibn Sulaiman, Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, Abd al-Malik ibn Abi Bakr, and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Uthman, as well as many others. Although Kharija sought knowledge from many scholars and left behind many students, he was known to have narrated very few narrations. He was not one of the scholars who excelled in the science of hadith or narration, though he certainly excelled in many other fields. Given Kharija's reputation amongst the people of Medina, and in fact amongst Muslims in general, it was natural for him to attain the respect of not only the general masses, but also the caliphs and governors. During the caliphate of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, Kharija was treated with great respect and honor by Omar and his governors. In fact, Omar had made it a habit to seek the advice of scholars in all his affairs, whether public or private, and he always placed the scholars on a high pedestal. And Kharija was definitely amongst the lead scholars on Omar's list of advisors. 
Caliph Omar had appointed Abu Bakr ibn Hazm as governor of Medina, where Kharija was living. At the time, Kharija had become a well-known scholar, and he spent his days teaching people about the faith and helping them resolve their problems. Now, one of the known aspects of the Muslim government at the time was that it gave specific portions of money to the people, both the scholars and the general masses. For some time, however, Kharija had not been receiving his allotted portion that he deserved to receive. Caliph Omar was counted by historians as the fifth rightly guided caliph after Abu Bakr, Omar ibn al-Khattab, Uthman ibn Affan, and Ali ibn Abi Talib. May Allah be pleased with them all. This was due to his justice and extreme care for the affairs of people. So, following upon his justice, Omar sent a letter to his governor, Abu Bakr ibn Hazm in Medina. In the letter he wrote, When you receive this letter of mine, then pay to Kharija ibn Zayd his due portion from the treasury. Without hesitation, the governor gathered the money that was to be paid to Kharija and immediately sent it to him. When Kharija received the money, he immediately carried it and rushed back to the governor and said to him, There are many other people who could receive the money just like me. I don't like to see the caliph assigning a specific portion of money to me in person. If the caliph's decree has also allotted these other people with a similar financial offering, then I will accept obligingly. If, however, he has not allotted them a similar financial offering, then I would hate for the caliph to allot something to me. In other words, he was saying, I can't accept a financial offer or gift from the caliph if he's not going to give a similar one to everyone else. Governor Abu Bakr ibn Hazm quickly sent a letter to Caliph Omar, informing him of what had happened. The Caliph wrote back, apologizing that the treasury could not possibly pay to everyone in the general public as it had decided to pay to Kharija. In the letter to the governor, the Caliph wrote, Give Kharija my greetings and tell him that the funds are not sufficient to do what he suggests. But had there been enough funds, I would certainly have done so. And Kharija decided not to take the money. This was the extent of Kharija's jurisprudence and understanding. He would not accept money from the caliph if a similar grant was not going to be made to the general public. He correctly viewed the affairs of people with one measure stick, treating everyone equally. To him, there was no difference between a scholar and an average person. No one was above the other. If the caliph was going to take from the treasury the public money of the Muslim community, and he was going to give a scholar, then he should also, in Kharija's view, give the general public. Thus it was that Kharija gave Caliph Omar advice to be fair in his treatment of all people. You're listening to Biography on IBN, the Islamic Broadcasting Network. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. He's lazy. She's stupid. He's a racist. That one's greedy. And there's a terrorist. If you look at people and all you see are labels, everyone loses. Labels hurt all of us and they're wrong. Every one of us is unique, a -a one-of-a-kind original. Every one of us is a -a one-of-a-kind original. Every one of us is a -a one-of-a-kind original. Our diversity is our strength. Instead of stereotyping, we can all learn from each other. Don't let prejudice shape your view. Take the time to get to know people and see for yourself who they really are. We are all one, one of a kind. Stereotyping is wrong and it hurts all of us. Stop stereotyping. A message from your American Muslim neighbors and the Islamic Media Foundation. IBM 
TVN is your voice. Let us know what you think of our broadcast. Email us at feedback at ibn.net or call our feedback line at 703-241-9659, extension 6. Your opinion counts. Welcome back to Biography on IBN, the Islamic Broadcasting Network. I'm your host, Suhaib al-Sayyid. As we mentioned before, Kharija became known for not transmitting many narrations or hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He was, though, the most famous to transmit narrations on the authority of his father, Zayd ibn Thabit. May Allah be pleased with him. In one of the most famous narrations, his father Zayd said, The Messenger of Allah commissioned me to learn the language of the Jews, or Hebrew. So I embarked on fulfilling the task, and within no more than half a month, I had learned their language. From then on, whenever he wanted to send a message to the Jews, I would write it on his behalf. And whenever they sent him a message, I would read it to him. It was from this dedication and commitment that Kharija learned to have dedication and commitment in his own life. He saw and learned from his father the value of knowledge. And he came to understand that there was nothing impossible for him to achieve. If his father had mastered a completely new language in a matter of two weeks, what could he possibly not learn or achieve in his life? While Kharija was not a great resource when it came to narrations, he became a great source for logical reasoning and critical thinking in deciding matters that did not have clear narrations or sayings attributed to the Prophet, peace be upon him. After all, as times change and realities are altered, the challenges and difficulties that face people also change and acquire different tastes and appearances. Thus, it's very critical for the successful jurist to have the necessary skills to be able to accommodate his knowledge to the realities of his environment. And this necessitates the ability to think critically and to reason with logic. Furthermore, the revelation of the Qur'an did not come with detailed or specific rules and regulations for all aspects of life. On the contrary, the Qur'an came to set general guidelines and regulations that are designed to direct our understanding of how matters in life are to be conducted. The life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, came as a guiding example as to how these general rules and regulations are to be interpreted and applied. And from the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the rightly guided caliphs learned and followed suit. They realized that the first and primary source of guidance is the Qur'an. If what they are looking for and seeking is not in the Qur'an, the next step would be to look into the sunnah or the guidance of the Prophet peace be upon him. If they still could not find anything, then they would resort to logical reasoning and interpretation, using whatever is available of text and authentic statements and verses as guiding posts. The companions, however, also realized that resorting to logical reasoning and extrapolation was to be limited to those instances in which there was no clear evidence or no verse. Otherwise, they would never dare to reason with a clear verse in the Qur'an or with a statement of the Prophet, peace be upon him. One example that shows the extent to which this was a reality was when Caliph Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was sending a letter to one of his appointed governors. The scribe who wrote the letter added a line at the end stating, this is the opinion of Allah and the opinion of Omar. When Omar read the statement, he yelled at the scribe and said, Woe to you! This is the opinion of Omar. If it is correct, 
that I was inspired by Allah. And if it's wrong, then it comes from Umar. Undoubtedly, Kharija came to learn this methodology from the example of the companions he lived amongst, one of whom, of course, was his father, Zaid. He reached a point where he very much valued the school of thought that made use of logical reasoning, and he utilized it. Some people may be under the false impression that the school of thought that relies on logical reasoning and extrapolation give scholars immense and unlimited powers. Some may even venture to believe that rulings based on logical reasoning are easy and simply require good intellect. But that impression could not be farther from the truth. In fact, throughout history, those among scholars who adopted this methodology were very careful in how they applied it. For example, Imam Malik ibn Anas one of the four great scholars of Islam, once said, I've been thinking about a certain matter for more than ten years, and I haven't yet made up my mind on it. Can you imagine? More than ten years, he is contemplating a specific issue, and he cannot make up his mind on it. Obviously, this tells us that he could not find any evidence in the Quran or in the guidance of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to direct him as to what to decide on it, and at the same time, he could not venture to allow his logical reasoning to determine a final decision without quite a lot of hesitation. When he was once asked about a matter, and he responded, I don't know, the questioner commented in surprise and said, I'm just asking about a simple matter. But Imam Malik became very angry, and he said, there is nothing in the matters of faith that is simple. Haven't you heard the verse in which Allah says, Indeed, we are revealing upon you a burdensome matter? And Kharija followed this example throughout his life. Among scholars and historians, he became well known for his excellence in matters of jurisprudence, especially the laws of inheritance. In the year that Kharija passed away, he said that he had seen a dream. In the dream, it seemed to him that he was building something that was made up of 70 levels. After he completed the 70th level, the structure he was building collapsed. Kharija then said, I am now 70 years old, and thus I have completed the structure of my life. True to his prediction, it was the last year of his life. In the year 99 after the Hijrah, or migration of the Prophet peace be upon him, Corresponding to the year 718, Kharij ibn Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari passed away. All the inhabitants of Medina followed his funeral procession, led by the governor of Medina, Abu Bakr ibn Hazm. His death occurred during the caliphate of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. When the news came to Umar, he was in shock and declared, To Allah we belong, and to him we shall return. What a great loss! Kharija will indeed forever be remembered as one of the great scholars and seven jurists of Medina. May Allah shower him with his mercy. Please join me every Tuesday here on IBN, the Islamic Broadcasting Network, as we take a look at a new Muslim personality that made a difference. If you have any questions or comments or would like to suggest a personality to be featured, please email me at biography at ibn.net. Until next time, I'm Suhaib al-Sayyid. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. This program has been sponsored by the Islamic Media Foundation, sharing the guidance of Allah through broadcast media and the Internet.